these questions were the ones that got me into economics. When I was a teenager, I was interested in these. And, uh, you know, full circle, 40 years later, well, 40, 30 years later, I sort of realized I had accumulated enough of a knowledge base and had actually come back to many of the questions that I had foolishly felt could be interesting to investigate when I was in my teens, and so so we wrote this book. But yeah, James and I, you know, we go way back, 25 years, 30, almost 30 years now. And just one day you were like... We just met, we, we met, and then we sort of came to the realization that we were both interested in the same things that nobody else was interested in at the time, and yeah. so we started researching them. We wrote, like, uh, I mean, now by now we've probably written over 50 academic articles and three books. But, you know, in the 2000s especially, we wrote several articles which were the well, late 90s or 2000s, which became the basis of this book. But then it took us a long time to do all the history reading and everything to... Yeah, it's excessive historical. Yes. It's a lot of evidence. And it took you how long? Well, you know, when we got down to it, it took us about a year and a half, two years in total. Okay. But because a lot of the research was done already for academic articles and teaching and things like that, so okay. it wasn't like blank slate. Right, right. I, I, I thought I read somewhere it was like 15 years. Well, 15 years is, is, was the research that led to it, exactly. The reason it. Right. Okay. Sure the reason why we wrote the book is because we think the fact that there is so much poverty around the world is a tremendous puzzle. We have achieved an enormous level of technological virtuosity. We have so many resources. We live in a globalized, connected world. But then six mil billion people are in poverty in the world. How come? And you know, there are many aspects to it. You want to understand slums in the cities, you want to understand inequality within countries, but a large portion of this poverty is caused by the fact that many, many nations in the world are still not doing well economically. They have not achieved prosperity, they have not achieved economic growth, and we wanted to understand that. And that's what, the, that's what triggered the book, and that's why the book is called Why Nations Fail. And the previous arguments No, I mean, you know, we, James and I came to this as both economists and social scientists. And there was a large body of work either squarely investigating this issue or skirting around it and discussing it in passing. But none of the arguments struck us as compelling or even hugely useful for understanding the root causes of this poverty. You know, many scholars, both social scientists and some uh, uh, scientists who come from more biology, physics, or other backgrounds, have emphasized all these geographic factors, natural resources, access to rivers or sea, temperature, climate. And when we looked at it both statistically and historically, we concluded there is poverty in every climate, and there is rich uh, economic activity pretty much in every climate. So there is no deterministic relationship between geography and prosperity. Okay, so geography's out. Geography's out. And what about the ignorance Yeah, so even more sort of widespread is the view among economists and uh, commentators, journalists, that it's the leaders who make mistakes or who take the right actions, and that shapes the economic prosperity and economic potential of a nation. Look, of course, there is something to that. Policy mistakes abound, and there are some visionary leaders who 
are able to articulate some new policies or new approaches, just like FDR was able to do during the Great Depression, for example. But on the whole, we thought this sort of the problem is the ignorance of leaders or ignorance of uh, business uh, uh, community or, or such arguments are both limited, but even more importantly, they're also putting the emphasis in the wrong place. So for much of history, we thought that poverty is not an accidental byproduct of other things. It's actually created by design, that there are politically powerful actors, kings, monarchs, dictators, sometimes democratic politicians, sometimes business leaders, sometimes community leaders, who make decisions largely understanding, largely aware that this is going to create benefits for their group, for their supporters, for their cronies, and at the expense of others. And that's really at the root of the problem of inequality in the world. Of course, then they might find a way of justifying that through some ideological garb. But how else would you understand slavery? Sure, some slave owners in the US South before Civil War would tell you they were doing this for the good of the slaves. But slavery was ultimately about exploitation. And if you think that slavery was a historical anachronism, far from it. It is just one version of the same thing that has happened throughout history and even today. I mean, you know, until it collapsed in 1994, in 1994, the South African apartheid regime had much in common with slavery. Uh, it had, again, it, that had disappeared even before then, 1994, but it had a, a color bar that meant that black South Africans, more than 80% of the population, could not work in anything other than the most unskilled occupations. They could not become supervisors, they could not become carpenters, machinists, clerks, uh, accountants, anything that really would give them a, an opportunity for social mobility. They were repressed, they were excluded, and this was not poverty of a huge population of South Africa that was created by mistake, but it was created by design. If you go to Egypt, if you go to North Korea, if you go to parts of Latin America, you know, you see different versions of the same story, but it has much in common. And that's really what we had to understand. And that's why a lot of the arguments in the book are about the politics of poverty, because who controls political power, what they do with that political power, for whose benefits and at whose expense. Those are the critical things we discuss. It's not necessarily politicians that control political power. It's sometimes politicians. It's sometimes others. Uh, you know, there are sort of more Marxist readings of history that sort of make out politicians to be unwitting uh, agents of some class interest. Our emphasis is much more on the politicians as well as the economic interests, but often politicians do their biggest damage first by grabbing resources and becoming economically very rich as well. So it's not that people like Mugabe or Mobutu uh, in Africa, two leaders who have run down, one of them run down Zimbabwe, the other one run down the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Zaire to the ground, or Saddam Hussein, you know, they also became economically the richest people in their countries by using their political power for grabbing all of these resources and putting them in their pockets, or as the case may be, in their Swiss bank accounts. So, so it's, there is that aspect of it as well. But yes, politicians are definitely not the only elite that we need to look into, we, take, we need to take into account, but they are also at the heart of the story. So why do we do that? Well, well, look, again, there are thousands of ways in which people can justify these things. But I think oftentimes people are motivated by their own selfish interests or sometimes the selfish interests of their narrow group. And the way to look after those interests is often 
costly for other people. You know, if you are a cotton producer in the U.S. South, your objective may not be to impoverish hundreds of slaves, but the way you produce cotton at low cost is by repressing, exploiting, and harshly treating those slaves in completely inhuman conditions, and that becomes accepted. And if you are a uh, businessman in Mexico for much of the 19th century or the 20th century, the way you surge ahead in terms of wealth, power, prestige, is by forming a monopoly and beating down your rivals, making deals with corrupt politicians so that they don't let anybody else to enter, and then using some bad technology and charging and forcing people to buy your products even if they are not very good. Again, the purpose may not be to impoverish other people, but impoverishing other people is really an inseparable part of that strategy. But there are even more pernicious examples. Many of the leaders throughout history, and certainly in the 20th century, have understood that to monopolize power, which comes with all of the economic and the political benefits that we've mentioned, they have to push down their rivals. That's why many of these leaders are quite openly murderous. That's why they try to actually hold back any groups that could become sufficiently powerful and challenge them. So there is an even darker side to power politics. This is, this is when you label as an extractive institution. Yeah, an extractive institution is a broad umbrella. It covers all of these things. And it covers other issues as well. You know, in the book, we put a lot of emphasis on these purposeful actions that leaders or political elites take to enrich themselves or to accumulate political power and prestige at the expense of others. But there's also neglect. If you look at several centuries of Spain falling behind the rest of Europe, a lot of it is neglect, that there is an insular elite. They see the economy going to the dogs, but they're not doing anything about it. And if you look at cities in many places, until there is an awakening and political power shifts away from a current elites to some other groups that try to do something different, provide public services, improve education, or uh, garbage collection, or something like that, you know, a lot of the problems of these cities would be neglect. But that neglect is also embedded in an extractive system because that neglect originates from the fact that you have these political leaders, they are politically powerful, nobody can challenge them, and they're just looking after their own interests and they don't care about the rest. And that is, I think, as important as purposefully pushing people down, but history is full of these people being purposefully impoverished and that's also important to understand. Generally, the nation is poor as a whole, but there are exceptions, and those are interesting as well. So in the book, for example, in passing, in about three or four pages, we discuss the case of Barbados uh, uh, in the, at the beginning of the 18th century. At that time, Barbados was like the US South on steroids. It was a slavery-based system, very, very, very small very coherent white elite sitting atop a plantation complex. But by some estimates that seem quite credible, Barbados was the richest place in the world. It was producing sugar, which was hugely productive in Barbados and hugely expensive in the world. And sugar exports made a huge amount of money. But all of that money went into the pockets of those big uh, landowners, plantation owners. Some crumbs went to the sort of the white middle class that existed or the smallholders. But again, 85% or so of the population that were black were repressed viciously. Their life expectancy was in the low 30s. They lived at subsistence. They were banned from even learning how to read or write. They had no autonomy, no rights, no assets and they were 
often gone down because they were not sufficiently obedient. So you see an example of an economy that under some cer special circumstances can create a lot of riches, but it's again under an extractive system, it's not going to be distributed equally. Not well, that is another aspect. That's a great issue. There are many examples of what you would view as extractive systems, kings, monarchs, dictators, and they manage to generate economic growth for at least a certain amount of time. China throughout history, Russia in history, uh, the Islamic empires, the Ottoman Empire, those are all examples of highly repressive extractive regimes that during certain periods were able to flourish economically, often because the state invested in uh, irrigation or trade infrastructure or there were some even some important technological investments such as in Song's China. But sustainability of that growth is often shaky. And that's why what we call extractive growth in the book is defined by two key characteristics. One is that because it's under an extractive system, its gains are not equally distributed. They are captured mostly by the elite. Some crumbs may go to the rest of the population, but the elites are the main beneficiaries. And second, it doesn't generate that innovation, new technologies, new efficiency gains, and that makes it much more likely to come to an end, either because its engine is not working or because the elite starts some sort of infighting. Right. It, it, it has an expiration date. It's not a deterministic expiration date. You wouldn't be able to say, look, it's going to run out in the year 2022, but it has an expiration date. Right. I mean, you know, China is the ultimate case in point and the one case that everybody is sort of interested in, rightly so. I mean, you know, first of all, if we're going to be honest, the success of the Chinese economy is really amazing. In the 1970s, China had the income per capita of a middle of the road African country extremely poor at a time when Africa was even doing much worse than now. Uh, nobody would have pegged it as a success story or a coming success story. And since the 1980s, it has grown at s over 7 8% a year. There is some debate. Some people say even higher. But, but you know, really breakneck speed of growth. How did it achieve that? I think that's really very important for the whole world to understand because there might be lessons, but there might be also lessons to avoid in the Chinese example. Well, you know, I think there are two aspects of it that really need to be emphasized but also distinguished. One of them is that China started this growth process by holding back some of the most extractive elements of its system. So if you look at the Chinese economy in the 1970s, it was a much worse and much more strict version of planning than the Soviets ever experienced. For example, the economy's uh, heart was in agriculture, but the agricultural sector was collectivized in a very inefficient way. Nobody had any incentives to produce. There were no prices. Uh, you could not benefit from undertaking any kind of investments, in even following. And the reforms that started after uh, Mao died and his hardline supporters, including his wife and the Gang of Four, were cast aside, and Deng Xiaoping and the more sort of reform-minded Communist Party leaders came to power was, okay, we're going to revive the economy. They first started in agriculture, introducing some incentives, prices, uh, making people, you know, uh, 
wanting to grow more stuff, wanting to grow the right stuff because they could sell it to some sort of market, although it wasn't a free market. And then they built on those and, and, and started rationalizing agriculture and you know, uh, rolling back the most extractive elements in the agriculture. And then that, from there, it went to industry. So it is important to understand that much of the first 20 years of success in China was a journey from the most harshest version of extractive institutions to less extractive ones. But also, the second point, there's also no denying that all of this has taken place under a political system that is still monopolized, repressive, harsh, and extractive in its own way. So is that a puzzle? No, because that's what you know, brings us to my earlier discussion of extractive growth, that you know, extractive systems can sometimes generate incentives for growth, especially when that growth is going to benefit uh, people who are politically powerful. And that's what we have seen in China. I mean, you know, no denying that China has pulled up upwards of 700 million people out of poverty. But the main beneficiaries of growth have been you know, Communist Party leaders and businessmen associated with them early on through corruption and then later perhaps through other arrangements that have again sort of benefited a, uh, a, a, uh, a relatively narrow segment of the population. There's, I'm not saying that as a criticism. That may have been the only way of spearheading growth in China, but I am emphasizing that you know, that sort of growth, as you would expect, is not going to be broadly shared. It's not going to go uh, to and benefit everybody to the same extent. But, you know, we should also be clear about what it is that we can learn from the Chinese experience. First of all, I think if you take the, uh, you know, over a billion people who live in sub-Saharan Africa, they would, most of them would be happy to have half of the growth that China experienced. But is that a model that can be exported to Africa? And even if you could export it, are there other costs that would make the benefits perhaps pale in comparison? I think those are the questions. You know, if you first look at the questions, so start from the latter. I think if you talk to many African middle class or civil uh, society leaders, they are very clear about what the Chinese system exported to Africa would mean. Complete end of freedoms, much more repression, much less access for them to the resources and opportunities. So there's a lot of backlash against the Chinese system. On the other hand, many leaders, especially authoritarian leaders in Africa, are much keener on importing the Chinese system. But secondly, and that now we're getting into more detailed stuff, but I think there are also limits to how much you can export the Chinese system. Because what made the Chinese system work in some sense is that even though it was very extractive and there was a lot of problems, there were many problems, uh, you know, China had a functioning bureaucracy, had a lot of state capacity, a system that goes back to 2,500 years uh, uh, <coughs> to the Qin dynasty that developed a model of government under fairly authoritarian government institutions, but still with a bureaucracy that could function despite uh, these uh, uh, repression and, and, and sometimes non-representative demands on it. But if you look at many African countries or Latin American countries, you don't see even the beginning of that state capacity. So the good sides of the Chinese system cannot really be exported to these countries in a very straightforward way. But you know, there are still many lessons to be learned, so there's nothing, nothing denying. But coming back to where we started, yes, I do have serious doubts about how replicable as well as how sustainable the Chinese system is. And again, there is no deterministic expiration date I wouldn't be able to tell you China is going to stop growing in the year 2025, but its problems are going to multiply, and those are going to be both economic and political problems.
70s and late 80s, isn't that when the rise of globalism started? And they started, you may be getting a little off topic, but they had outside buyers, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think Chinese growth in the second stage when industrialization started was very much driven by global demand. China became the <clears throat> factory to the world because it had low cost and abundant labor. But you know that doesn't, in my mind, minimize the achievement of China. First of all, many other countries had abundant labor and cheap labor. And second, China first managed very rapid growth. And actually, a lot of the poverty reduction came before that stage when agriculture really got its act together and started feeding itself rather than going through famine. So there, there, there are true successes in the Chinese case. And culture, look, you know, one of the other theories that people love about growth and democracy and prosperity, that it's cultural. It goes back to Max Weber, you know, Protestant ethic is important for capitalism. Islam is incompatible with democracy. There is something special about Jewish culture that makes you more educated. And, you know, I don't want to minimize culture, cultural factors. Of course, traditions matter, and people have their views, and those views shape how you interact with others. But at least the naive form of the cultural theories are, in my mind, very deficient. You know, the same people who, you know, today say, well, of course, China and Vietnam are growing because they have a special, very valuable Asian culture you know, 40 years ago would have looked at Vietnam and China, two of the poorest countries in the world, and we would have said, oh, it's their culture that's holding them back. And look, that culture has changed. If you look at what families teach their children, the role of Confucian culture, the relationship between society and authority, let alone all of the taste that people have in food and, uh, and, 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 and within family relations, so on and so forth, there's a huge amount of continuity. If you go to Taiwan, which is a very, very different place than China, you'll see the same culture. But Taiwan is highly democratic, very against Communist Party rule. They have a very different economic model. So that same culture is consistent with many different political and economic choices. So that doesn't mean culture doesn't matter at all, but it's not a, this sort of simple story of culture determines your potential. It's more like what you make of that culture, how you use those traditions, those norms, those relationships. And when you're allowed to. And when you're allowed to. And you don't succeed in every period of history. Absolutely, place. absolutely. And, 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 but you know, you're also, whether you're allowed to or not, and that's another topic that we haven't touched on, you know, that is often not something that's given by elites. It's something that's taken by people. You know, Taiwan today is not a democracy because its leaders in the 1950s decided, oh, we should create a democracy here. You know, Taiwan was created by Chiang Kai-shek, who was a warlord, a terrible person, a murderer, uh, and, and, and as authoritarian as you can get. But, you know, of course, conditions changed. When he went to Taiwan, he was no longer the generalissimo of China, but a renegade, and he needed internal, external support had to make different choices. But more importantly, the fairly authoritarian system that he wanted to build did not succeed. And the Taiwanese people started demanding more and more democracy, more and more right, and more and more of an inclusive system, which they successfully got. So I think those demands from bottom are really an integral part of the, of the history. There's a lot of controversy on this and in, in history. And I, I, I'm not, I don't want to criticize, you know, uh, standard historiography, but you know we tend to have a very top-down view of history and de-emphasize the role of the people, the, the small demands that build up into bigger demands and really become the engine of institutional change, political change, economic change. I think those are really important elements of history that we really have to study if we want to understand how the world has changed, and especially the success stories of the world. Right. I want to get into that 
Yeah, that is a controversial topic. And it's a topic that we actually sort of avoid in Why Nations Fail because we didn't want to get bogged down in that controversy. But since you ask, let me share my views on that. So, you know, first of all, there is no doubt that United States at its founding was a country of contradictions. It had a large part of it that was under a terrible economic and political system. Slaveholders viciously repressing, exploiting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And the political structure that supported that was also quite terrible and extractive. But other parts of it, no, by, 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 by any stretch of imagination, not a paradise, was very different from that slavery part. A lot of the wealth of the country at the time of its founding came from slavery. And early on, the US South was uh, as rich or potentially richer than most of the other states and colonies. And moreover, uh, historians who have been very critical of slavery are also right that the North partially benefited from the harsh treatment of slaves in the South. Why? Because the natural resources that were processed, such as cotton and tobacco, were supplied both internationally and domestically and reduced their costs. But I think it would also be an exaggeration, in my opinion, to say that slavery created US capitalism or US riches. If you look at US growth, this defining period is the 19th century. And in the 19th century, it really takes off with industrialization, especially in the North, almost exclusively in the North, and slowly spreading to the Midwest. There is a huge amount of investment and growth in industrial output that comes together with a huge number of new inventions and innovations, new technologies, a lot of creativity, a lot of entrepreneurship. You look at the South, none of that is happening. There are no new technologies, not even new technologies for cotton production or tobacco production in the South. And the input from the South in those new technologies is quite minimal. If you look at defining things like the American manufacturing system, uh, new textile machinery, all these labor-saving technologies that are you know, quite critical to the new industries, in the, especially in the second half of the 19th century. Again, they have very little to do with slavery or the benefits from the US South. So in that sense, uh, you cannot say that U.S. slavery, U.S. Southern economic system was directly responsible or a major contributor to it, but it also, the whole history makes you uh, get this feeling that the dirty, ethically, morally questionable compromises that American leaders have made at every stage are important and mean that we have a lot of atonement to do. You know, US Constitution uh, endorsed slavery. Many of the founding fathers were slaveholders themselves. Uh, in the, after the Civil War, uh, presidents from Johnson to uh, Rutherford Hayes, uh, all the way to FDR, made deals with Southern elites who even after slavery was abolished and black Americans were given the right to vote made sure that economic opportunities and political voice for these groups were suppressed. And American presidents and northern elites made deals with them. So their hands are not completely clean, but that still doesn't imply that there wasn't a core of very dynamic economic creativity that was really unparalleled anywhere else in the world, perhaps with the exception of the UK, in much of the 19th century.
In the north. In the north. Well, that's a really complex s story because, you know, I think when you have a relatively homogeneous economic system, then you can call it extractive or inclusive. Right. If you right. So if you look at the South by itself, of course it is an extractive system. But if you look at the U.S. as a whole, right. well, it has an in inclusive core and an extractive core and then some area in between. So that's really... The, but it's not just a civil war. Yeah. Look, civil war, it's the story, I mean, Americans uh, know this quite well, but they should know it even better. You know, the civil war uh, ended some of the worst practices of slavery, suppression, uh, and exploitation of blacks, and things looked like they were changing truly during the Reconstruction period when you know, uh, blacks started migrating, they got into politics both at the state level and, 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 and the national level, federal level. Uh, new economic opportunities started opening up, many of them went into business. But then all of those were cut short, especially after the northern troops were withdrawn by President Rutherford Hayes. And, uh, and the North sort of became disinterested. Southern at least started recreating a system that was different, but had many parallels to what was there before the Civil War, and especially after the so-called redemption period, bringing the separate but equal Jim Crow and everything, a uh, really a, uh, a, a terrible repressive era of few economic opportunities and a lot of inequities in the South got recreated again. So that I would call another extractive system. But in some sense, it became even more marginal to the rest of the US because US was growing and inputs from the South were less, much, much less important. So again, it's a sort of a complex story. US story is one of the most complex ones when you try to fit into this bigger narratives because it has different parts and different parts are going in their own ways and interacting in some nuanced manner, but, but yeah. It's a, it's a mini version of an apartheid regime. It's a, but then it's it's embedded in a different system that's very different. Yes. That that also matters absolutely. Right, absolutely, and 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 you know, I don't also want to emphasize too much that you know critical junctures are always disruptive, in the sense that they always create big challenges, but they don't need to be things like black death. So the way that we describe critical junctures in the book is that they are periods during which existing institutions can no longer be maintained in their current way. And so that generates a sort of window of opportunity for change. Uh, you know, it, it, it ranges from many things. It could be created by outside events. Those are the simplest ones. Uh, Black Death, decimating the population of Europe and parts of Asia. International war, new technologies completely destabilizing the situation. But, you know, it could also be, in many countries, the death of a leader or emergence of some new coalitions or a shock like COVID-19. So there are many of them, and, but they are still somewhat rare. It's not something that happens every year. And that's why when a critical juncture occurs, you know, it is also a, an opportunity for those who could form a coalition or a movement or a political party to push for something better to take advantage of because they're not going to occur every time. So, you know, if it is indeed the case that COVID-19 is going to really make us rethink our uh, political system, 
what we do as a social safety net, how we fight poverty, how we create opportunities. I think that is potential, is potentially a critical juncture for the U.S. for Western Europe. Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, for the world. For the world, yeah. Oh, well, you know, many critical junctures go bad in the most boring way. You just don't do anything. You try to and you succeed in creating a bastardized version of business as usual. You know, we could decide not to do much at the end of COVID-19. We could even allow things get much worse, perhaps when we come out of this crisis, as it looks likely, we're going to have a landscape where a handful of companies are even bigger and more profitable than they were before, and their managers and their engineers are going to be richer than before, and there are going to be fewer opportunities for Americans with less than a master's or PhD degree. So that would be uh, an even more dire situation in terms of poverty, in terms of inequality, and we could just say, look, you know, we'll find a way of dealing with this. Let's just continue with what we have. And that's not out of the question. And that could happen under both a Republican or a Democrat president. So it's not that it's just electing one president versus another. So there are many examples in history of similar critical junctures where essentially successfully or unsuccessfully you try to recreate the, uh, the system that really wasn't working before and you can even survive for several more decades under that. So if we don't take this opportunity, it's not that we're going to have a revolution in the United States in the year 2022 or 2023, but you know, we're seeing how the discontent is building up, how many people are being left behind, how uh, there is a growing alienation of the American people from the system, from the uh, more successful parts of the economy, and, and all of those problems would continue to multiply. I don't think that's an important problem right now. I think, yeah, I think uh, right now the danger for the U.S. would be not borrowing enough in order to deal with the COVID crisis. We need more money to help the unemployed, people who are suffering because their incomes have fallen. We need more money to make sure that our health infrastructure is built up. So I don't think that at this particular juncture we would create uh, huge risks by borrowing more. Uh, by failing to borrow, by failing to act, we could create dangers. But I don't want to I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that government debt is not a problem. I'm certainly not saying that inflation is not a problem. Inflation would be a huge problem. But in this current economic environment, the government spending another trillion dollars is not going to make inflation more likely. Yeah, they don't. I mean, this is I would make a little off topic here, but this is something that everybody seems to be really worried about all the time. We don't really print money, do we? We don't really print money, no. Right. That's not how you're going to create inflation in, right. in the current 21st century environment. But this is a question somebody asked me the other day, and I don't know the answer to it. He said, you know, why, don't, why do we keep just accruing debt? Why don't we just print all the money and pay off the debt? Well, if we did that, that would be more destabilizing. Right. But even that is, you know, look, for inflation to occur, you would need that the government starts you know, printing more money or increasing reserves, but at the same time, banks would need to start lending all of that money, neither of which is happening right now. So I think for inflation, we're probably, again, things may look very different in three years' time, but, but right now, I think the emergency is make sure that those who have lost their jobs or have seen their incomes fall do not suffer unduly. Right. Food on the table. Food on the Eat table. Their exactly. Eat their Look, I mean, you know, and that's very important, not just for humanitarian reasons. I mean, I think it's most important for humanitarian reasons, but uh, 
a lot of the political problems that we've had over the last 12 years is not unrelated to the fact that many people who did not even make huge financial mistakes ended up losing their homes and ended up overnight from having positive assets and a middle-class dream home to being homeless, jobless, rootless, and, and all the backlash that that created. I think those are, especially in the 21st century, hugely disruptive events. You know, we live in a world in which much greater stability, people have aspirations, you know, things that would have been terrible 100 years ago are going to be completely unacceptable today. So, uh, so I think, you know, protecting innocent people who would otherwise be plunged into poverty, I think, is a priority for governments in the West. Yeah, well, that's right. Right, that's right. And, uh, and you know, in some sense, uh, we are taking two liberties with that title. First of all, we are defining failure in a broad way. Not, not succeeding is failure. That is actually intentional uh, because we want to emphasize that really success shouldn't be exceptional. Success isn't that hard. It's just that we are politically not calibrated for success. And that's why we have to explain failure because it's the artificial institutional political choices that we have made that lead us to failure. And then the second liberty that we're taking, in some sense, is that, you know, when the title says why nations fail, people might think, oh, well, that's the exceptional thing that they are failing. But actually, no, failure is the uh, norm in society, in, in history. A lot of the countries, both today and in the past, have failed in generating income growth, uh, good living standards, good health conditions for their populations. Well, you know, first of all, what we define as inclusive institutions is an ideal type. It's some, is an ideal that no country ever has achieved. When we give examples of inclusive institutions, those are never perfect. That has to be borne in mind. But really, you should think of inclusive institutions in three layers. The first is economic, and that's very simple. We can talk about the details, but the big picture is clear. We define inclusive institutions as those that create opportunities and incentives for the people, not just for a few scions of the richest families, monarchs or dukes, not just for the cousins of the dictator or the military junta, but for the broad population. Opportunities, you know, that's what we miss most of history. If you go back to South Africa under apartheid, that's an extreme case of no opportunities for 85% of the population. But if you go to US South, well after slavery had disappeared in the 1940s, 1950s, there are no opportunities for black Americans and there are not even that many opportunities for white low-income Americans. So, those opportunities have to be there. But then also you need the incentives that people actually grab those opportunities. So if you provide everybody good schooling, but then you don't give them any incentives because they can't succeed in business, they can't succeed in professions, they cannot succeed as workers, that's not going to work either. So, so those incentives and opportunities, they need to be at the heart of the economic system. And then we go through what 
are the things that would actually uh, be best for generating such things. The market economy is key, not an unfettered market without any regulation, but what we call an inclusive market, a market built on public services, public education, regulation of monopoly so that there isn't a power imbalance. Uh, but, but those sorts of market institutions are still key because the alternative to markets is central planning, and that's not going to create opportunities or incentives in any appreciable form. Then you need that uh, inclusive economic institutions to be embedded in inclusive political institutions. One needs to make sure that the other exists. One needs to be there in order to be the basis of the other, whether that they are in positive synergy. And inclusive political institutions really are about the political analog of the same economic principle. The inclusive institutions fail when opportunities are monopolized, when money is monopolized by some groups. And political inclusivity fails when political power is monopolized by some groups. So, so that's why it's critical to have some sort of democratic institutions. It's critical to have some sort of checks and balances or constitutional rules so that whoever gets elected doesn't misbehave. That's why it's critical to have some state capacity that the state is capable of regulating, uh, enforcing law and order, and all of these things. But the third layer is really at the root of this, and that's really, uh, we talked on this a little bit in Why Nations Fail, but it's the topic of our more recent book, The Narrow Corridor, that James and I wrote uh, last year. And you really need political mobilization of the masses, that people need to be engaged in politics. They need to be part of the political machinery. They don't need to, they, they shouldn't just let politicians or elites or the learned ones to rule the country. So that sort of political engagement of the people is an important safeguard of these inclusive political institutions. Yeah, I don't think they are more politically minded in the sense that they are not really engaged in the true issues of politics. They, politics has become a blood sport or at, uh, at the very best a sort of a, a version of I support my team, you support your team, a political polarization. They're not really monitoring the politicians. They're not really looking at what's going on. They're not really demanding that politicians deliver in terms of public services, poverty reduction, uh, <clears throat> a direction for the country. So I think those are very, very important. And again, I think uh, democracy is never a tidy affair. So it's okay, I think, that there are periods in which uh, people pour into the streets, there is democratic instability, there is democratic gridlock, those are acceptable in my opinion. But at the end of the day, we really need the, the democratic process to <coughs> start delivering incentives to politicians to, to, to behave right. They need to pay attention to the particular. They do. They do. Yeah, I thought I heard you say in a lecture or something calling it like the cage leviathan. Like Shackled leviathan. Yeah, yeah, that's the, so we, that's the key concept in the narrow corridor. You need a leviathan what Hobbes thought as the all-powerful state, but it needs to be not the Hobbesian Leviathan that stands atop society, but it needs to be a shackled Leviathan that's constrained, shackled, uh, restrained by society. By the, the, the 